Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jadley, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast, an iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very, very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Stitcher Radio, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, Audible, wherever you find your podcasts. Our guest today is Ginny Roig. She is the founder and leader of the Roig Academy, a school for kids with language-based learning challenges. In a moment, Ginny will be joining us in the studio to help us understand how we can best help our kids develop a love of reading and learning. Of course, one way we can help our kids develop a love of reading is by giving them access to fantastic books. That's why we're so happy that so many of us have access to great public libraries. Also, folks have access to those little free libraries scattered all throughout the world. And we want to help, too. We are in the middle of our great back-to-school book giveaway, and we would love to for you to enter our contest to to win one of dozens and dozens of books that we're going to be giving away as school returns to session. All you need to do is to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram, at Jedly Magic on Twitter. Just find one of our back to school posts. All you need to do is to like it, Share it for some extra credit. You'll be entered to win one of our dozens and dozens of books that we'll be giving away here in the month of September. Oh, you can also go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the Contact Us button. Let us know you want to be entered. Joining us on the line right now from Miami and Florida, our guest today is the founder and the driving force behind Rowig Academy. It's a school for kids with language-based learning challenges. Please welcome to the show, Jenny Roig. Hey, Jenny, welcome. How are you? Good morning. Good. How are you, Jed? Thanks for having me. I'm I'm really wonderful. I'm um, really excited to speak to you. Um, first off, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, language-based learning challenges? I'm imagining a lot of folks listening might be saying, eh, what does that mean? Yeah, so it's it's very broad, right? Um, specifically, my area of concentration and specialty is dyslexia, mm -hmm. where there is um, an impairment or a deficit in the phonological component of language, and you'll have secondary consequences, which might include reading comprehension. Reading comprehension. Interesting. Now you're saying it's a phonological. When I hear that word, I'm thinking hearing, um, and I think a lot of people. Uh, when they when they hear the word dyslexia, um, it was always oh they they turn their B's into Reverse D's their and, letters. and that, and so they think yes. maybe it's a visual thing. But nope. the more I'm learning, it's more auditorial. So it's a language based learning disability in which the student experiences difficulty in either accurate or fluent word recognition. Um, so it, it, it can it can impair many different areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now is mm -hmm. this. One of the, I, I had a conversation with a reading specialist who shared that kids, that, that we don't see a lot of dyslexia in places like China where the kids are not, the, the, the language is phonics based. When they're reading, they're learning individual characters. They're not mm -hmm. trying to piece together phonetic sounds. And, and decode, you know, words. Uh, is that right. something that you're that you've also um, read about or know about? I, I have read about that, and the English language is very complex. There's 26 letters and 44 more phonemes or sounds, right? So it is very, it's a very complex language, very rule based, and some patterns in our language don't follow rules. So we not only have to learn the rules, we have to learn the exceptions, what the exceptions are, and when those exceptions are made. Hey, Jenny, I got to ask this. It's going to sound stupid. I apologize. But you just shared with us is 26 letters. There's 44, I think you said. Uh, sounds. sounds. Mm, about sounds. Mm. Why hasn't anybody come up with the simple idea of like, let's add some more letters, make it easy? 
<laughs> That's a good question. If that is a stupid question, it's a great question. Um, I'm not quite sure because I know our language is composed of different backgrounds. We have Latin roots, we have some French, we have, you know, Anglo-Saxon. So our language is comprised of, you know, several different roots and languages and, and, and countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell us, uh, how do you at your school help these kids? So the way, so we understand that these children have struggled um, with reading and we know that we're not born to learn how to read. The, ra the brain is not naturally wired to learn how to read. We have to teach this skill to our, to all students. Um, the way that we teach um, at our school is based on the science of reading. And we subscribe to two to real main theories of reading, which is one, um, the simple view of reading, which is by Gowan Tumburn from 1986. And it, and it really states that comprehension is a product not only of decoding and phonics, but also language comprehension, vocabulary, and content knowledge. And then you have Scarborough's a rope, reading rope from 2001, which is broken down into two categories. So one is language comprehension, and it has a subset of skills there. And the other one is word recognition, which has another subset of skills. And combining all of those skills is where are the many strands that are skilled in, are, are woven into becoming a skilled reader. So we use a multi-sensory approach. We use the Orton-Gillingham approach at our school. So it's very explicit. It's systematic. It's multi-sensory. Um, it's that that's the way we teach at our school. Wow. I've never heard that expression. Science, the science of reading. Uh, yes. Can you, can you kind of expand on that a, a little bit? That's, um, it, it seems it, as soon as I hear it, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. So there are a lot of, um, neurologists, neuroscientists, psychologists that have studied this for many, many years. Um, a lot of that, a lot of that terminology, again, a lot of the brain work that I'm familiar with comes from Marianne Wolf's work. Um, and she really talks about how we're just not wired to learn how to read. Naturally, we're wired to learn how to walk, um, and do other, other things, but reading not specifically. So we really have to be taught explicitly how to do that. And reading, um, is, is comprised of several skills, as I said. Said, right. So there is phonological awareness, there's decoding, there's sight word recognition, but there's also background knowledge, which is part of the topic that, that I think we're talking about is why is it important to read to mm -hmm. your child, right? So when you're reading to your child, you are exposing them to background knowledge, vocabulary, literacy knowledge, um, just building upon different experiences to be able to come to the table and access your, your reading and not only access your reading, but really understand what you're reading right because first we read to learn and then we learn to we first we're learning to read and then we have to read to learn mm -hmm. so the primary goal is to obtain comprehension mm. jenny you're talking about the the importance of reading with our kids when when you're working with a group of kids in a classroom can do you have a sense of which kids have been or are being read to on a regular basis and which kids aren't you you have an idea on the surface for through having conversations, their vocabulary, some of their experiences, because a lot of those things are what build skilled readers. Um, but not until you dig a little deeper and maybe work with that child a little further and maybe even do some informal assessment. Can you tell? But on the surface, typically children that have great vocabulary and great language skills are usually an indication that they're going to be reading is going to come fairly easy to them, yeah. but precisely have they been read to not really specifically, but you on the surface, you can kind of have an idea. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. You're talking about vocabulary. One of the things that I've heard is that kids who are read to every day for 15, 20 minutes, when they arrive at um, preschool, kindergarten, mm -hmm. uh, they've, they've heard over 800,000 more words than their peers 
uh, who haven't been read to. Is that something, does that sound right to you based on your experience? That, that, that does sound right. That does sound right. And, and there's a lot of in evidence that indicates that reading aloud to your children each night is important for several reasons, right? So bonding time with parents or even an older sibling. I love when, when parents ask me, well, how can I, how, what can I do? I said, you know what? You can grab your fourth grader and your fourth grader could read to your first grader, right? So you're, there's so many great, great things are happening at that time. They're modeling fluency exposure to vocabulary, increased comprehension, and building back our knowledge on a particular topic. And then you can even follow up with a field trip. So like a great example is, you know, reading the book Through the through through with the Zoo by Jacob Grant and then following up with a field trip or vice versa, having the field trip, visiting the zoo, and then following up with with a good story to build that vocabulary and that background knowledge. What a great idea because I'm you know, I'm imagining hearing a word one time, you're using the example of the, of the book about the zoo, you know, maybe hearing the word uh, hippopotamus, it, you know, right. you hear it in a story, okay, you talk about it, you hear it again, then you go and you see the hippopotamus, that's going to drive that Correct. word into that kid's awareness. Sure. And even the setting of a zoo, right? So is the zoo, where is the zoo located? Um, you have zookeepers, you have fences, what are their fences made out of, right? What are their the barriers maybe are where you have, you see the monkeys, um, just so such every environment really could be a language rich environment. Mm. So if you have those conversations. So when we're going out with our kids and we're in a new environment at the supermarket, at the zoo, it, it when we're out in nature, it's, it's really helpful for our kids. And we might not understand this, we might not make the connection, but when we're, helping our kids see different things and pointing out different things and using words like, well, this is a fence or it's a wooden fence. It's, you know, has pickets in it or it's a, correct, uh, you know, and, and help them understand that it's more than just a fence. There, there are other words correct. to, to describe it. Correct. Wow. This is really fascinating. <laughs> so we can, you know, parents can basically make every moment a, a learning adventure. Absolutely. Even a drive in the car, Yeah. even a drive in the car, the grocery store, the doctor's office. I mean, everywhere our our everyday locations. Yeah. And you mentioned driving in the car. I'm imagining it's much more beneficial for kids to have those conversations and point out different things to kids instead of letting them hear us scream at other drivers as they're cutting us off. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> hey, you, one of the words that you used was reading fluency. There's, a, can you talk a little bit about the difference between somebody who is a fluent reader and someone who is able to just barely make out the words of a sentence? <laughs> Definitely. So, so like I, you know, I was talking about, um, earlier is we have, you know, a, a few theories of readings, but the ones that we subscribe to at the Roy Academy are really the simple view of reading and Scarborough's reading rule. So the simple view of reading um, speaks about the decoding piece, right? So there's two pieces and one is decoding and one is language comprehension. So decoding is being able to apply sound symbol relationships to read words, right? And, and the alphabetic principle and language comprehension. So the ability to understand spoken language. And when you have those two components, that equals reading comprehension. So you should be able to comprehend what you're reading as opposed to just one component as mentioned in, in Scarborough's reading group from 2001, where she breaks up, her, her research is about breaking up um, into in, into two components, so language comprehension and word recognition. And there, a, you, you have language comprehension, which again we spoke about in background knowledge, vocabulary, language structure, um, and word recognition, phonological awareness, decoding, and sight recognition. So you'll have some students, unfortunately, which are just taught to learn to read by sight. So they have the, the larger chunk of the word memorized by sight. But unfortunately, when you have to break things down into smaller units, it, it, it could become a little more difficult if they're not really taught the smaller units of sounds. Mm, interesting. What is that? Can you give us an example of, you know, a kid who's memorized the, the big word, but then they're not able to break down those, those individual sounds? Sure. So if we look at a word like unresolved, Okay. Right. So if you can take un, 
and and that would be the prefix and 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 understand the meaning of on and then understand the meaning of the word resolve right so an older student uh, it would would be able to break that up mm-hmm. into two into two pieces and really understand what the word represents and what it means oh okay hey uh, i've i you know i've been on here and i'm not an expert by any means i you know, i probably shouldn't be hosting a show called the reading with your kids podcast but one of the things that I've been saying is that, that we should continue to read and co-read with our kids in, 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 in second, third, fourth grade, middle school, even even high school. Uh, am I right about that, or have I been leading people down the wrong path? No, absolutely. The more sophisticated your vocabulary is, I mean, you it's going to assist you in comp- not only in comprehension, but it's just in vocabulary and understanding spoken language in a conversation with somebody. So again, that, that modeling of reading and having that time to read aloud with your child, it could be reading an article with your middle schooler for, for homework assignment. So it's, it's definitely still relevant, not just limited to preschool or early years. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you, we, we started off by let, letting folks know that you're the Rowing Academy serves kids with learning challenges. How important is it for, for parents of kids with learning differences how is it how important it is is it for them to be reading with their kids so so it is it is it is just as important and we know that dyslexia does run in families so one parent might struggle to read with their child versus another parent the non-dyslexic parent or the parent that maybe didn't struggle as much so there are many things you could do audiobooks you could do digital books because that might um you know ease the 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 labor for that adult, right, that may have struggled with reading, but still expose that child to a positive experience with literacy. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's one of the things we've talked about is that kids are able to um, hear a story on a much higher level than they're able to read. Correct. Yeah, fascinating. And being exposed to that that more more sophisticated vocabulary, they, they, they then pick that up. This is this is really, really fascinating. Hey, can you tell us a little bit, um, a little bit more about your academy, and um, you know how big is it? How did you come to find, you know, to 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 create your own academy? I've never thought to do that. I never thought people could just start my own school. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to. So prior to starting the school with my husband, Gus, we were both educators in the school system in Miami. I was a special education teacher and he was a high school teacher. So prior to our son's birth, I was a tutor. I saw many students struggling from all sorts of school settings and found that they had a variety of gaps in their learning. So I thought that if I compiled the skills and the training that I had um, into one comprehensive curriculum, they would be free to do after school activities and be a, be a child, right? So enjoy things like soccer, ballet. They were just spending too much time um, in tutoring. So at first I started homeschooling these children and then eventually it transitioned into a, a larger school setting. So yeah, so we have a neighborhood bilingual preschool and then we specialize in children with dyslexia grades K through eight. So our school is about a hundred students. Wow, so cool. I, and tell, we've had um, a number of, of uh, different experts. Um, one, one of the, our, our favorite guests is Dr. Ron Melmed, who's a developmental pediatrician. And one of his phrases, you know, he acknowledges that there's, uh, you know, there's definitely kids who need to take some sort of medication to help them learn. But his big thing is skills before pills. Is that something like that, that you folks a- adhere to at Rowing Academy? We we absolutely do, and I and I love that term. I think I might I might I might use that term. I'm, I'm sure uh, he would mind. Before pills, yeah, I love it. Um, no, definitely, definitely, because you have to give the child the benefit of the doubt that maybe he wasn't exposed or she wasn't exposed to this form of systematic teaching, right? So this explicit form of teaching and multisensory form of teaching. So we we definitely try that, particularly in the younger years, um, and see what types of results we get from that observation and that intensity and that frequency of providing that type of instruction. Um, Yeah. So, so there is, um, you know, so if, if a kid is exhibiting a lot of, uh, I I like to joke and say extra energy 
And, <laughs> you know, their kindergarten or first grade teacher may be saying, oh, this kid needs some medication. Um, you don't have to jump to that route right away. There are different things. Not right away. Yeah. And I always think I, I – Again, like I give the child the benefit of the doubt that there could be something else going on prior to jumping to to that pill, particularly at that early age. And we know that some of these, you know, we we know we can see early signs of dyslexia or a reading disability as early as pre-K three and pre-K four. Those children that aren't recognizing their letters and their numbers. So if you think about it, if these children can't keep up with their peers and they realize this is hard for me, then my only other option is to misbehave mm-hmm. so that I can get some sort of attention, whether it's positive or negative. So some of it becomes attention seeking behavior. And unfortunately, it's it's usually negative more than positive. <sighs> I, you know, I, I, I was never one to enjoy negative attention. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, I guess if, if Who does? It, yeah, well, I know, but like you said, if, if a kid isn't getting any kind of attention, maybe that is better than feeling ignored or invisible. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, how can people, I, cause I know we, we do have listeners in Miami and in Florida, but we have listeners all over the world. How can people, um, you know, what kind of advice can can you give to parents who are listening, who are struggling with this, who are going into their schools and they may be in a public school where we only teach things one way? Uh, what what do you suggest those parents do to help their kids get the specialized help they need? So one is, you know, one is to is to really first seek assistance, right? If your child is not keeping up, is to Again, you know, take those steps to go to the pediatrician, possibly go to a child psychologist to have a child diagnosed to see if there's something going on. You, some teachers, unfortunately, will say they'll just outgrow it. They'll outgrow it. They, they won't outgrow it. These we, we have a lot of research and a lot of evidence that suggests that these things can be picked up as and identified as early as maybe not identified as early as pre-K, but definitely, you know, I've been screening children, preschool toddlers for dyslexia for the past four years. So I'm, I have those three-year-olds and their four-year-olds on on my radar in our school. Um, and it's just an indication of what's to come, right? So if we see somebody struggling, we intervene appropriately. But um, in Reading Rockets is a great website, offers a lot of activities, the Florida Center Council for Reading from F- Florida State University is another great um, website with a lot of um, activities that teachers and parents can definitely implement at home. Yeah. And if somebody is in the Miami area and they're interested <laughs> in um, and possibly having their child attend your school, wh- where can they get more information and what's the process? So the, it, it, on our website, we have a lot of information on our website, which is uh, roigacademy.com, R-O-I-G, academy.com. Um, there's a lot of information there. And the process is to just follow follow the, the prompts on the website where there's an inquiry form and then there's an admissions criteria because we know what type of students we, we know how to help and we know what type of students we um, we need to assist these parents in finding the right school because we, we're trained on certain sorts of um challenges and uh is there any way for you to provide services for folks beyond your immediate community do you do any kind of consulting for folks in in different parts of the country we do we do yes many parents have uh, consulted me remote remotely and i've helped guide them through different um, schools or different programs or just even looked over their paperwork and given them suggestions well this type of evaluation is missing um, you know, to, to further confirm what could be possibly suspected. Yeah. And for, and for teachers, there's a lot of resources out there as well. The International Dissect Association is a great resource. The University of Florida, um, the last, the School of Education has, the Dyslexia website has a lot of information there for teachers and parents as well as resources. Yeah. You know, that, 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 uh, a service that you offer for, you know, just helping a parent looking at their IEP and seeing if they're getting, seeing if they're getting the services that they need. One of the frustrations that my wife has experienced over the years is, you know, a lot of times she's in, uh, in, in an IEP meeting and, you know, the parents are looking at 
out of form in, in their, their, their words and phrases and terminologies. The parents have absolutely no idea what the professionals are talking about. My wife does, uh, you know, she, she's done a lot to help parents understand that. I'm imagining that not every parent uh, of a child with a learning disability has somebody like my beautiful wife who wants to make sure that they understand what's going on. Sure. And it's a lot of information, right? It's a lot of information to process. So like your wife, I, I was a placement specialist. So I used to develop the IEPs along the psychologist. Um, and it is, and I've been in those meetings and there's just so much information and they're just at that moment processing possible diagnoses, a, a change of placement possibly, right? So there's a lot of emotion yeah. in those meetings. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that a lot of the information, sometimes it's, it's hard to reach these parents, but when those parents that call me, I'm, I'm happy to, to always guide them and, and assist them on their journey. Well, that's that's really wonderful, and um, I'm I'm thankful for uh, thankful to you and your husband for what you've been doing for kids. I'm thankful to all the teachers out there, and I'm really thankful that you've come on and shared this information with us today. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. Our guest would be Chris Eliopoulos. He is returning to the podcast to celebrate his brand new picture book. It's called The Giggles Are Coming. That's the next episode of the show. Hey, if you are the author of a fantastic children's book, we would love to have you as a guest on the podcast. Being a guest, it's fun. It's easy. It gives you the chance to tell thousands of people about your fantastic book. And it doesn't cost a thing. And there's no need to pay anybody to facilitate being on the show. It's Wicked easy, as we say here in Boston. All you need to do is to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click in the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page. Scroll on down to be a guest. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to thank our guest, Jenny Roig, the leader of the Roig Academy. I also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.